Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am Jennifer Halpin. I'm the co-owner of Toronto Kids Physio here uh, in Toronto um, and actually in the broader GTA. Um, and I'm here today to speak with you about the role of physiotherapy in pediatric brain injury rehabilitation. So what I hope to cover off today is what defines a pediatric brain injury, um, and then really talk about how it's different from an adult brain injury. And then what does this rehabilitation look like when it comes to a child compared to an adult? Um, and then what does it mean when we say that we want to try and achieve maximum physical potential? How do we ensure that these children are able to participate in activities with their peers? And then any lifelong considerations that need to be factored in because we are talking about children. So I am Jen Halfin. I, like I said, I am the co-owner of, of Toronto Kids Physio. We have three locations in the GTA so far. Um, one is at Midtown, which is Young and Lawrence, Lee Side, um, Eglinton and Laird, and Markham, which is where I'm at right now, um, is Highway 7 and McAllen. Um, so I'm a pediatric physiotherapist practicing, but I also co-own the clinics. I graduated from McGill University in 2010 with my master's in physiotherapy, um, I have a history of being a figure skating coach. I actually also worked as an ambulance driver in my once upon a lifetime life, um, and now a physio, and I'm also a mom of three. My children are nine, seven, and four. So what is Kids Physio Group? Um, this We are a private practice of just physiotherapists working with just kids. So there's actually a bunch of locations across Canada, in BC, Saskatchewan, uh, there's a Winnipeg Kids Physio, there's a Halifax Kids Physio, there's a, um, Oakville and Hamilton in Southern Ontario as well. Uh, and our mission is to provide the care needed for all kids to reach their maximum physical potential and 100% recover from injury whichever might be more appropriate for their situation. And so you'll see me coming back to this theme of reaching maximum physical potential because this is one of our mission statements and it also applies greatly to children who are recovering from brain injury. And our slogan, most importantly, to near and dear of my heart is we make physio fun. And that's because it's kids and you can't just stand there and tell them to do bicep curls and squats and whatever it may be. You really have to make physio fun. And I'll explain a little bit of how we do that over here at Kids Physio Group. So start off, what defines a pediatric brain injury? Well, you can imagine it's quite simple. It's if there's a brain injury, whether it's mild or severe and sustained under the age of 18, anything under the age of 18 falls under the umbrella of pediatrics. That being said, something that you'll see me refer to a lot in this presentation is calling these individuals CYPs, child or young person, because heaven forbid you should call a you know 15 year old a child they might get a little mad at you so we call them cyps just because it encompasses the whole phases of childhood and into adolescence as well but yet it is still pediatrics and that's what we see here at kids physio is kids under the age of 18. so something to note is that a tbi traumatic brain injury at younger ages is actually often associated with possibly worse outcomes than an injury sustained later in development and this is really important to note because children are growing and the brain is growing. And so there are windows of development where it's actually, quote unquote, worse to sustain this brain injury during that period of time. You can imagine in infancy or adolescence when there's a string of growth and development that's occurring on a cellular level in the brain, that this is actually more impactful when it comes to a brain injury. And this is something that we want to be mindful when we're considering pediatric brain injury specifically. Now, on the flip side of that is that children also have a large capacity for recovery. Um, they are growing brains, again, coming back to that cellular level, and they're able to train areas of their brains to learn new things or take on the job of other areas of the brain that might be affected. So when we're talking about pediatric brain injury, looking at it from that holistic approach of, okay, there might be this window of development where it's actually more impactful to sustain this injury, but there's also this huge potential for recovery, and how can we balance those two? I also wanted to bring up a point here is that concussion is also considered um, technically a mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and the reason why I want to bring it up here is because it is a very common pediatric uh, occurrence. Uh, the prevalence is about 10 to 20% in the population, although it's 
they are widely unreported uh, or underreported. And it's estimated that about 50% of concussions never go reported. And the fact of the matter is, it is a mild um, traumatic brain injury. And if it's improperly managed, then there can be longer term brain damage and there can be um, severe brain injury or fatality. So we work with a company called Complete Concussions to make sure that we're staying up to date on the research as possible. Our treatment evolves um, as the research progresses, but it was important for me to note that so I can explain why um, when we're looking at what a pediatric brain injury is, it can include these kiddos that go through um, these concussions, especially if they're child athletes who go through multiple um, concussions. And so basically, a concussion, when it happens, is a period of brief cognitive of, of this little energy. Um, you can see over here, you have the energy um, fluctuations that happen when the brain gets injured, and then a dip in this mass of energy over time. Um, this is just a to scale and show that, you know, we have this vulnerable period in here where if we do sustain a, a secondary concussion in this period of time, when the brain is recovering, that's when the more um, traumatic damage can occur. Um, so it follows the very similar, similar principles of rehab of a TBI in that there's a brief period of cognitive and physical rest, followed by gradual symptom um, limited physical and cognitive activity. Um, we also work with the schools, which you're gonna hear me talk a lot about today, um, but the schools are encouraged to have concussion policy because these are so common that, you know, not necessarily everybody knows how to treat them. So it's really important that the school knows what to do um, and that the, their sports know that they shouldn't go back to sport until they've returned to school um, and until they're able to introduce um, symptom limited physical activity. So keeping this in the back of our minds of, okay, we're looking at TBIs, but we're also going to factor in those kiddos who go through these concussions on this journey as we talk about what a rehab entails. So why am I here today? I'm a pediatric physician therapist. I know that you've had presentations in the past from adult physios, um, and I actually watched that one on YouTube as well. So I'm going to speak specifically to what makes it different about pediatrics. How is a TBI in childhood different from an adult brain injury? So simply put, children are not mini adults. A lot of people think, oh, it's just the compact size. It's not. Um, childhood development is complex. It encompasses physical, psychological, cognitive aspects, all along also with increasing environmental expectations along the way. So what does that mean? You've got a child who's learning how to do their motor skills. You know, we started off as a baby rolling, sitting, crawling, walking, running, jumping, stairs, ball skills, looking at it through that like physical lens. But all the while, there's also these demands that are increasing. So what, what is expected in a social setting of a five-year-old is expected in a social setting for a nine-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old. So with these growing expectations, go along with these growing skills and anything that's going to disrupt the way that these two systems interact is going to make it really complex when we're delivering our care. So neurological injury secondary to trauma, so brain injury in childhood, can affect these key phases of development and there can be long-term consequences when we look at how do we manage it long term? So, what is something happening at four or five years old? How does that affect what the child then looks like at 14, 15? It's already been 10 years post their injury, but they're still a child, right? So, we want to make sure that we're interjecting ourselves properly in these key phases of development, which doesn't happen for an adult TBI. Um, with that, a big take home message that I'm going to talk about throughout today as well is that repeated evaluation is going to be necessary. There's going to be more changes that happen over time with a child who goes through a TBI compared to an adult, right? So if an adult has a brain injury. They're not going through these key phases of development like a child is. They're not going to need as much constant reassessment, constant check-in as um, a child will, who is going to go through growth spurts, is going to go through puberty, is going to go, you know, transition on from a school environment to a working environment. And the way that we support these children along the way is exceptionally important. So again, here, just another point to discuss how a TBI in childhood is different from an adult brain injury. So there are also, besides these key phases of development, there is the key anatomical and physiological differences in the pediatric population when compared to adults that can modify these outcomes from a brain injury. So there's greater water content in the brain. There's greater cerebral um, blood flow and oxygen consumption of the organs. There's ongoing myelination, which is the bones developing and all these synapses happening um, and the, the bones growing, everything that is happening on a cellular level 
to these children as they as they grow. Now, I'm not here to give you sort of a biology, anatomy, biology lesson, but it's important to keep in mind that a developing brain going through all of these changes is going to react differently to an adult brain. And there's actually a lot of research happening now to see how the body's response, how like this the, the chemicals that change that fire when there's an injury to this pediatric brain that has a different biochemical makeup, how, what are those actual physiological changes? And then how can we use that to affect and navigate our treatment as a result? So a big factor here that's different when you talk about a child versus an adult, like I touched on a little bit earlier, is about the need for communication um, between the school and pediatric rehab. Often when an adult is returning to work, it's a very different system to work with when you're working with an entire school system and a child that's going through different grades and different school systems and needs different services. So I find that the biggest part here um, is making sure that there's enough understanding amongst parents about the need for that connection between therapy and educational support following a discharge. Now, I'm in the unique position today to speak to you from a private practice setting. There, we can talk about the school board. We can talk about the public setting therapist. I'm going to look at it through the lens of a private practice therapist who gets the luxury of being the extra person on the team um, if the family can support with that and uh, you know how we connect with the school physio with the, with the teacher or with the um, hospital physiotherapist but it's really about making this connection and following it through the course of the child's education that makes it a different situation than dealing with um, an adult so because of that another layer factor is that compared with adults children and youth have the greatest risk for long-term consequences of TBI. They're living with this through a larger period of their life than an adult. They're also growing with it through a larger period of their life than an adult, which means, again, how do those changes affect? They're going to need constant assessment and reevaluation um, because they are vulnerable to these different changes and phases of development. So, what does rehabilitation entail when it comes to a CYP? The biggest thing that I'm going to focus on is teamwork. As a private pediatric therapist, I'm going to make sure that I'm getting in touch with the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, the psychologist, the behavior therapist, and the school, because not only are we working to, you know, on these physical skills, but we're also going to be working on the social emotional skills, the mental skills, and the more that we can have crossover between all the different disciplines, the more that I can add in some of the OT goals, some of the speech goals into my sessions, the better outcomes we're going to have because we're going to be doing it across the different disciplines. If I know that the speech therapist is working on XYZ, I'm going to make sure that I'm having those types of conversations when I'm doing my physio. Um, and that's going to lead to greater outcomes for children when we cross um, coordinate all of our goals. Uh, the other thing and we want to make sure is that the medical information is shared to from the healthcare setting to the educational setting. So all of these things are going to be really great to have the teachers aware of as well, so they can make sure they keep that in mind when the child returns to the classroom. Our ultimate goal when working with a child is working towards full participation in all the aspects of the family, school, community life. And we're going to do that through the appropriate assessment and goal setting and intervention, but again, only doing it together as a team. So an example of that, I kind of said one about, you know, the, the speech, but I want to talk to you a little bit how, you know, physio can focus on motor skills. But we, with a child with a brain injury, we always need to factor in what are the sensory, what are the behavioral, what are the communication, what are the cognitive changes that are going around when it comes to setting these goals? So an example I can give is, let's say you've got a child who can walk pretty well um, in the clinic. They've got no balance issues. They walk down the hallway of the quiet clinic space and they're doing great. But you know, from their other disciplines, that attention is really hard for them. Loud noises are really hard for them. Visual distractions are really hard for them. So how are you going to train your walking in the nice quiet hallway here at the clinic to walking in the school? So they might lose their balance there. That might cause them to have increased risks of falls. So making sure that you're having that communication so you can attune that goal accordingly. It's not just great. You walked 50 meters in the hall at physio. How am I going to make sure that you can walk those same 50 meters in a busy, noisy hallway at school? And that's where I'm going to focus my work. Another example of how a physiotherapist can support a child going to school who may have some similar issue to this is if they've got 
motor learning processing, you know, reduced processing speed as a result of their TBI. Well, great. I can one-on-one -on -one in the clinic say, let's work on our throwing and catching. Let's work on our standing on one foot, whatever it may be. But how does that translate to a busy gym class when their gym teacher is giving them five different step instructions and they've got to follow along and keep up with their peers? My job is then going to be to speak to the gym teacher and say, hey, we can't follow this many instructions in a row because of our processing speed. I want this child to be able to participate and do the same lessons that the rest of his peers are doing. So we're going to break it down and we're going to do it like this or however I've learned to do it with a child in our sessions. Uh, another example of this could be a child who has social communication problems. No problem here in the clinic playing soccer with me or no problem here doing things when it's one-on-one. -on -one, but how does that translate when we add the social communication piece so or the self-regulation piece and when it, we're in a larger group when that child's ultimate goal is to play with their friends again? So making sure that we're really looking at the whole picture of the child and not just zoning in on what physio is because as we're going to speak to now, I'm going to talk about achieving this maximum physical potential, the focus of this intervention needs to be able to maximize participation across home and school and community domains. So whatever is most important to that child is going to be how we carry out that therapy. So if it's most important for that child to play soccer at recess, I need to make sure that we're not only playing soccer one-on-one -on -one in a quiet clinic, but I'm doing it in a way that's going to help translate over. So the other interesting thing that I'll speak to now when it comes to maximizing a child after a brain injury, their physical potential. It's important to note that physiotherapists may actually also be working on skills that have not yet been achieved prior to the brain injury. So depending on the age that the child sustains their brain injury, we're obviously working towards everything I just said, getting them back to where they were with their peers. But what happens if it is brain injury that happens at a very young age when the child hasn't yet to learn to walk upstairs switching feet? or hasn't yet learned to walk, or hasn't yet learned to play catch. Not only are we going to be dealing with the sequelae from the brain injury when it comes to treating in a physiotherapy relationship, but we're also going to be teaching for the very first time some of these skills that weren't learned yet. So there's definitely no one size fits all when it comes to that, um, because we're going to have to meet the child where they're at and make sure that we're helping them you know, return to school or enter to school um, with whatever needs they may have, but we're also going to keep in mind what should a typical 9, 10, 15 year old be doing? What does that high level balance coordination look like that was never learned? And how do we bring it into the equation as well? So it's another very important factor to consider. So as we all know, Physical activity has amazing long-term health and well-being benefits, right? So even for, for any child who's, you know, typically developing for adults, us, we need to make sure that we're able to be active for as long as we can. And for a child who sustains a TBI, this might be a lot harder and more barriers for them to stay active. So from a very early on, early point on, when they enter community therapy and community intervention, it's really important to promote physical activity and start it as like the grassroots of how their trajectory is gonna go throughout their life. You also might have a child who was extremely physically active prior to their brain injury, and they might let, wish to return to the level of participation and that social emotional factor as well of, can they, is that even on the table or are we operating at a different level? So then what does extremely physically active mean now? So a child with a TPI can still remain extremely physically active, but it's for their baseline. Physios play a really important role in figuring out what that is. Physios are also, especially in the community, uniquely um, placed to be able to liaise between the school and the community activity providers to support this modified involvement. So if we've got a modified sports league that the child wants to be involved in, and you know we've got the school doing extracurricular activities, their physiotherapist kind of sits in the middle as the point person to help coordinate the physical needs in both of these different departments. Um, so setting these specific goals, you know, referring on to different local community disability sports clubs, advocating for participation in gym class, this is very much all about how physiotherapists can help try and achieve their maximum physical potential, depending on what the child wants and what the family wants to see. So something very important for us to cut here, and I mentioned it in my intro, is that we make physio fun. So 
all these important things that I mentioned that we should be doing. We should be maximizing, you know, their participation. We should be helping them get back into school. But how do we do that and how do we make it fun? So I'm sure that you've learned from other physiotherapy presentations. When we do our assessment, we look at it at, we look at the range of motion, we look at strength, we look at tone, balance, coordination, all those, you know, body structure and function things. And this is, when I say body function structures, I'm pulling these words from the ICF framework. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with it. I'm sure you might be, but the ICF framework is how we encompass what um, the trajectory of a child through um, their, their journey in terms of when we assess, when we treat and we make goals, we always wanna be thinking of this framework. Firstly, being like I mentioned, the body structures and function. As a physiotherapist, you're gonna come into my office. I'm gonna do the same, you know, looking at all the, these different features and assessing your baseline and where you're at. But I'm also gonna look at it through the lens of how do all these things affect your ability to do your activities of daily living. And your activities of daily living as a child is not just brushing your teeth and you know going to the washroom. It's also going to school. Um, and it's also you know being with your friends. That's also part of what it means to be a child. So I'm gonna see how can I guess best get you to do these activities on your own? Do you need a gate trainer? Do you need a stander? Do you need a positioner? How can I support there? Also looking at it through the lens of participation. So what are your likes? What are your dislikes? What were you previously doing? Do you want to go back to that? If you don't want to go back to that, that's fine. Let's pick something else. Do you need modified sports equipment? Having friends, having a social circle is extremely important for anybody in life but especially for children who are growing and learning these social cues and learning how to you know, become adults in this world, their brains are going through all of that cognitive development. They need to be able to participate in order to go through that growth journey. And again, as a physiotherapist, my role is to support that by helping them get involved in you know, sports and activities that will facilitate a lot of that social interaction. Um, the two other frameworks that are part of the ICF framework is looking at that environmental factor and those personal factors. So, you know, life is, I, lo I love this little picture over here where it's the little girl and she says, life is about having fun. Please help me do the activities that I find the most fun. So again, coming back to that baseline of how do we make it fun? How do we make it entertaining? Um, and then again, factoring in the family, factoring in um, the friends, the teachers, the, the support network that's around the child and making sure that they're involved so that we can best support um, the child on their journey. When we make goals, um, we like to call them SMART goals. If you've ever heard of those, they are specific, they are measurable, they're achievable, they're relevant to the child. Again, coming back to like what makes good for that child and then time bound. So I'm always making sure that I'm doing my assessment, I'm making my treatment around the ICF framework in terms of activities and participations. And I'm also um, making sure that I'm then setting goals that are specific to that child and what that child really wants to then go and do. So what does that treatment then look like? These are some, all these photos that are real photos are real photos of kids in our clinic. This is what our clinics look like. And I'm gonna show you a photo of our Markham Clinic uh, coming up next, but we play, we play as soon as possible. Um, we like to use games, sports, music, Whatever that child's top motivators are, that's what we're going to use. And we're going to make it look like fun. We're not going to be, you know, doing squats and bicep curls. We are going to be pirates going on a treasure hunt, looking for adventures around the clinic, picking up heavy objects, maybe getting that same muscle work in, but you'll never see me just doing straight curls or presses or, you know, walking just on a straight line and we're teetering on a balance beam because we're in Cirque du Soleil. We're having fun and we're using our imaginations. And that is what it's being a pediatric physiotherapist is all about. We also like to make sure that we use multi-component exercises to recreate real play or school scenarios. So it's going to involve a lot of off school courses, a lot of dual demand tasks. So we're not just jumping, we're jumping and catching, or we're not just catching, we're catching while standing on something unstable. We always like to combine two things together at the same time. Again, when appropriate, when a child gets to that level, because we want to make sure that we're putting them in situations where it can you know, be like, oh, I'm standing on uneven grass outside my school, or I'm playing catch, but I'm distracted by a motorcycle that drives by. And I want to make sure that I'm still able to do all these things safely. 
um, something fun that we actually have as part of our value set too at Kids Physio is that the physiotherapist, I always say, should keep up not to not just on our latest research when it comes to, you know, how to best practices of physiotherapy techniques, but you should be staying up to date on the latest pop culture trends, music, TV shows, so that you can relate really well to your clients. Um, I, I have a teenager that comes in here and their goal is to play with their friends. I'm going to make sure that we can do all the latest, coolest TikTok dance moves. And I've actually sent that home as a home program once, um, is to make a TikTok dance because the movements that were involved in it were really great range of motion activities. And it was so appropriate for her goals and what she wanted to do. She wanted to be in a TikTok video with her friends. She couldn't plan out the movements properly. We broke it down. We did it in session. And that was a physiotherapy goal. Um, and the last thing I want to point out here too is that the emotional experience is just as important um, when doing physically demanding tasks. So a large part here is this is going to be hard. It's going to be hard for a child to, you know, it's hard for anyone, um, but it's specifically for a child who's going through these roller coasters of emotions of not being able to do things that they once were able to do with their friends, not really understanding necessarily what happened to them, why it's like this, why their body's not responding in the same way that, that it used to. And being exceptionally sensitive to that emotional experience and receptive to it and aware of it and preempt a lot of that is really a true tenant of how to practice to make sure that the child is having a proper and enjoyable physiotherapy experience. Because not only is that the right thing to do, but it's also um, on a level that the brain will learn more when it's a happy brain. A brain that is very upset, crying, frustrated, angry is not going to learn as well as a brain that is having a good time and that is having fun. Um, and so that is a very key component when we're trying to make physio fun for that specific child. Oh, my pictures load. So just as an example, this is this is where I'm at right now. I'm in one of those back rooms. Um, I'm actually in this room over here in Markham, but you can see that when we talk about pediatric physiotherapy, we don't want it to seem like therapy. We don't want it to seem like a doctor's office visit. We are going to have fun. We are going to have um, a slide. We're going to have stairs to practice. We are going to actually have a ladder to climb because climbing is a great skill for a child. We're not going to do it when they're on the playground, right? We want to recreate those playground situations. Um, we even have over here a little mini exercise bike because riding a bike is important. So let's get back on the stationary bike. Um, we have swings. We have um, what toys, all these bins here are filled with toys, rings, cones. It's going to be a fun and a positive experience. And that's going to be a priority. Okay. So now we're talking about this community-based therapist. We're going to talk about how that therapist can assist in returning to school. So school is exhausting. I find being at work exhausting sometimes and these kids, their work is going to school. So as part of going back to school, we're going to do a phased return, but we're also going to do it in terms of managing fatigue. So school makes us tired. What does tired relate to? Endurance. How do we work on endurance? Through physio. Um, so having this phased return, we're going to take a look at what the baseline is. We're going to look at how do we scale endurance, and we're going to apply that to that child returning to the classroom. Can they walk in the hallways? Can they sit at their desk? What is taxing them the most from a fatigue standpoint? And how do we work on making sure that that energy and that endurance can be worked on then in the clinic? Um, so to that end, it's very important to involve the child's school in setting up these goals um, because they want to make sure what's, what does the teacher expect of them? Do they have a separate area for them to go to? Do they have to have, a, are they in a class of 30 people and we don't have an extra EA who can help out? The different unique settings of what's going on in that child's classroom is really going to tailor how the therapy sessions are going to then go forwards. Um, the other great thing about school when it comes to a child is that it allows for lots of repetition and, re and rehearsal of things and doing it over and over and over again. So we can take that you know, strategy of, okay, you know, when you learn things in school, you do it over and over again. How can we also add in, okay, well, you're also going to learn to do this over and over again, and you're going to do it at school. It also allows us to help carry over all the activities that we're doing in the therapy environment into a real world environment by doing them in school and then doing them, doing them in the clinic and then doing them in school and then carrying it over into outside the school. It also adds the layer of social interaction. So 
this is a piece that's very difficult for a lot of children, depending on the age that they sustain their injury, but re-entering the social scene with their friends and having their friends understand what they've been through, that's very tough. As physiotherapists, we can help in that by making sure that they have the supports that they need to physically be able to keep up in a way that makes is, is validating for, for, for them. Um, and then, so to that end, going across into the sports world, how do we make sure a child can return to sports? So I want to emphasize here that the participation in the sport that the child is returning to should be meaningful to the child and their family. If they were an elite athlete and being out of this, this area is really challenging for them, how do we make that meaningful to them now, depending on the level that they're at? If it wasn't meaningful to them at all, and they don't really care, they weren't an elite athlete, but they want to do some sports, again, what would it be fulfilling for them from a physical standpoint to make sure that they've got lifelong um, things in place to keep to keep that um, connection to the to their sport world. As we know, sports are a huge thing when it comes to kids, not even just when it comes to, okay, we're not organized sports, but even playing soccer at recess. Often, you know, when we work with kiddos in the clinic, we will sometimes see children who are typically developing and their main goal they come in is they just want to be able to play with their friends on the playground and not, and then keep up. And so this is another example of where physio can step in. Um, and it's also better assessed by a physio in the community than just in the acute setting, because that's when they leave the hospital, they don't even really know what that future then will be later on because of how much change they go through over time, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so again, it's important to consider the pre-injury participation interests, what's important for the child at this point in their rehab journey. Um, and, the, and a physio who's working with a child with a, a TBI, it's very important they get to know the community networks and organizations that are out there, like yourselves, um, but also the sporting, the sports world as well, and what sort of um, Paralympic, Special Olympic, what, what can be involved, what, what um, disability sports programs are out there that you can connect the child with, and then again, serve as that liaison between the, the two. So some lifelong considerations that I want to chat about just when it comes to kiddos with um, TBI, family-centered care is of the utmost importance. So, you know, for anyone who's been through something like this, we know that it doesn't just affect the child, it affects the family, it affects the parents, and there's a lot of feelings. You definitely should be connecting with your social worker and to make sure that you're doing family-centered care that empowers the family. Um, and you're going to want to touch base on this through all aspects of the, from the initial assessment to the goal setting, and then identifying all those rehab priorities um, and the ongoing review of recovery um, and development through that lens of family-centered care. What's important to them, what will make them feel safe is returning to uh, sports or returning to movement scary for the family. How can we best support through that, knowing the importance of movement along the way? Um, another lifelong consideration for a child in TBI is making sure that you're setting aside time for repeated evalu evaluations to address the changing needs over time. Again, growth spurts, puberty, different expectations. That child is, you know, has sustained the injury at a certain age. What's going to happen through the different phases of development to the range, the strength, the muscle tone, the balance. When they go through a growth spurt, does their, does their balance get all thrown off again? You know, how do we make sure that we're keeping on track with that, we got to set aside time to evaluate on a regular cadence with all those big milestones. Um, treatment should also be continued on an ongoing basis until the family is either able to self-manage or they don't need management for their neurological impairments, but they should always have you there as a resource. So what I mean by that is we never want to say that a child needs physio for the rest of their lives, right? But at the same time, we want to make sure that they either have a plan. So they want to, they're going to be in fitness or they're going to be followed by a sporting community or they've got their um, local gym that they're going to be part of so that they stay active and fit, but they can always come back to the physiotherapist for reassessments. Or we want to make sure that they've got their, they, they're not no longer concerned with X, Y, and Z that they're they're managing, but they've got support through, you know, another avenue to make sure that they're always developing. But then at the same time, you can always be there as a resource to the family. And then if they age out of the pediatric world, making sure that you're appropriately transferring that care on to somebody else who will be able to support the family 
and uh, through that that transition, but also making sure that we've got a lifelong plan for physical activity and fitness. Hey, so that's my little summary on um, physio for the specific considerations that we might need for a physio um, for a child going through a brain injury. Um, I have some sources over here that I've listed as well. If anybody um, wants to take a peek at those later on, I will stop sharing my screen, um, but I'm available to chat with any questions more specifically if anybody wants to know further. <laughs>